Uh, dear colleagues, hello everyone. My name is Mindogas Linkaitis. It is a great pleasure uh, to greet you from Lithuania, from uh, Vilnius University Life Sciences Center. Also, Vilnius University was established in the 16th century. This is one of the oldest in the region. Our Life Sciences Center is relatively new, and this year we celebrate our fifth anniversary. The Vilnius University Life Sciences Center is home to three academic branches that take part in joint activities, the Institutes of uh, Biochemistry, Biotechnology, and Biosciences. The uh, instructor uh, Eric uh, is a single point of access to technology and expertise for structural uh, biology research. Luthena became a new member of Instruct Eric since the beginning of last year, 2020. So now Instruct Eric has 15 members. And we are happy that the Vilnius University Life Sciences Center scientists not only have access to the unique infrastructure now, but uh, they also are eligible to apply for funding to use structural biology services at all instruct centers, as well as training courses, internships, and research and development awards. I am honored uh, today to present two speakers of the webinar Instruct Lithuania, uh, Professor Gintaras Valinches, uh, works in a um, biochemistry field and biophysics interface. He's a director of Vilnius University Life Sciences Center, and Professor Virginia Shikshnis is a biochemist, a Kavli Prize winner, whose lab independently developed the gene editing tool. Today, Professor Valinches will give us a speech about biomembranes on a chip. Please, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mandelbe. First, of course, I would like to thank the uh, instructor for giving us opportunity to, to uh, present our center as a, a new member of Instruct uh, uh, institutions. And uh, also, thank you, Mandelbe, very much for a brief introduction. So today I'll be uh, speaking about uh, tether phospholipid bilayers for protein membrane interaction studies. Uh, this uh, uh, technique and, and technology is being developed uh, at Life Sciences Center for quite some time in collaboration with uh, other centers across the world. Uh, so uh, briefly, uh, briefly, biological membranes uh, are essential building block of, of living organisms and they form spontaneously for, for the self-assembly. They ensure compartmentalization and separation of electrical charges and, and uh, membranes host numerous proteins that serve uh, various uh, functions in, in living organisms. So uh, no surprise, there, there's a whole plethora of, of models of biomembranes, starting with micelles, micelles, nanodisks, uh, vesicles, uh, various extended phases, uh, cubosomes, hexasomes. Uh, uh, planar membranes, uh, including black lipid membrane, are very well known, and the membrane model which contributed to, to a huge number of of discoveries in the membrane biochemistry. Uh, solid supported lipid bilayers uh, appeared in, in 70s and 80s of the last century, and they were being developed uh, uh, and different uh, substrates uh, were used, uh, including polymer substrates, uh, uh, metal substrates, uh, non-metal substrates. Today, I will, I will be focusing on tether bilayer membranes, which are shown right in the middle of, of the, of the of this uh, um, page, uh, those are uh, phospholipid bilayers, just you know, a few nanometer thick bilayers attached to the surface through, through the linkers, we call them molecular anchors to the surface. And the surface can be anything essentially, starting with, uh, with metal film, conducting film, you know, uh, non-conducting uh, materials like, like silicon or, or, or glass. Also, uh, recently we, we developed uh, several uh, applications uh, which involve uh, conducting uh, uh, transparent uh, substrates. Uh, the uh, cartoon, artistic cartoon, uh, shows how a tether bilayer membranes can be assembled, self-assembled. We use a mixture of, of organic molecules which attach the surface, and this uh, surface now is, is covered with anchor, uh, anchor compounds uh, which uh, trigger uh, fusion of, uh, of vesicles. Sometimes we use unilamer, sometimes multilamer vesicles, and after a brief period of incubation, which uh, 
uh, is not longer than uh, 20 30 minutes you can get you know uh, this type of, of uh, structure which uh, which is, is is highly electrically insulating indicating you know uh, full completeness and and, and uh, consistency so so there are several devices uh, on the on the left hand side you have you know uh, you you see you know uh, low cost laboratory devices which can be uh, in house made in essentially in any lab on the right hand side you see a special uh, uh, holders silicon wafer holders uh, which i use for uh, neutron reflectivity measurements you know this is one of the instruments we we used uh, the instrument at uh, the national institute of standards and technology at the center for neutron research in gatesburg united states we also uh, from time to time use uh, pulsed uh, neutron sources including the one in in uk router for typoton lab at, at ISIS site well, we, we develop you know, uh, this technology into uh, convenient uh, uh, um, uh, technologies uh, which can be used uh, uh, for, for biomedical testing. You know, and here you see a nine channel TBLM microchip for bioanalytical applications. It's, it's being developed uh, with a startup company, Lipidoms, and uh, uh, we also collaborate with other companies, including Micronet in, in, in Netherlands. Well, now I switch over to, to some properties, how, how the, the, these membranes can be can interrogated, how they can be studied. And, and of course, this, the most straightforward way is, is optical fluorescence microscopy. If you have uh, lipid mixtures uh, um, uh, tagged with some uh, fluorescent labels, you can, you can definitely fuse uh, vesicles. And, and then after rinsing uh, the system with, with pure buffer, you can uh, make sure that you have, you know, Either homogeneous or, or heterogeneous uh, layer of lipids on the surface. Uh, here we have, you know, uh, phospholipid only phospholipid uh, mixture, and here we have, you know, cholesterol containing uh, images, uh, which which uh, tells you a little bit of, about the lateral structure of the membranes. But of course, most of, most of the time we we use atomic force microscopy, which is again convenient uh, methodology for studying, you know, uh, phenomena on solid surfaces uh, and. Um, here you see the example of, of pure uh, diolyl phosphocholine uh, bilayer, uh, which is ex absolutely absolutely flat, you know, with, with roughness uh, fluctuation within plus minus 0.5 uh, nanometers. At the same time, if, if if the membrane for some reasons is is, is uneven, for example, phase separated, you can also observe uh, development and 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 the existence of uh, phase separated regions and 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 determine the size and and the protrusion level. Of, of these uh, regions uh, in, in TBLMs. Uh, this uh, methodology is, is, is quite convenient for studying um, uh, large protein complexes. And, and here you see you know, the whole uh, series of, of uh, cholesterol dependent cytolysins. Those are relatively big proteins. You know, the, the size of the, of the image is 200 by 200 nanometers. And, and, the, and the size of these um, axial uh, views you know, is 100 by 100 nanometers. So those are approximately 50 nanometer uh, large um, uh, pores, uh, which uh, can be visualized with, with very high level. Also, uh, you, you can do uh, using tether bilayer membranes, you can, can, uh, can do uh, a dynamic studies, sorry, dynamic studies uh, of, the, of the protein pore formation. You can see, observe, you know, uh, protein growth in real time, and also you can see diffusion uh, of the of the pore fragments in the in the in the bilayer matrix. You can see you know the, the protein, the part of the protein pore will diffuse into the image. Right now, yeah, you have you know the third pore here, which just came and and, and joined and, and formed some some type of cluster. Also, you can you can uh, uh, determine the the typical uh, time frame within which. Uh, the pore, a protein form forms. This is the, the first uh, kind of a seed of the pore, which grows into the ring-like structure. And this is the second seed, which appears in the center, in the center of the image. And then after approximately 10, 20 seconds, you can, uh, you can see the formation of almost intact uh, pores. So, so, so th both uh, techniques, both static AFM and, and dynamic AFM, are at Life Sciences Center here at Vilna, so anyone can, uh, which who wish to use this te technology can can come to Vilna and do measurements in Vilna. So speaking about the uh, memory structure inside the bilayer, uh, neutral reflectometry is, is the methodology of choice, and um, 
uh, uh, typically uh, those uh, measurements are being done on very large samples, so approximately 50 square centimeter sample. You can only imagine we have two nanometer thick layer. Well, from two to, to let's say five nanometer thick layer. And then we have, you know, this layer covering, you know, 50 square centimeters of area, surface area. But the most important thing is that we can get the material distribution uh, curves, which is on the, on the right-hand side, um, along the normal to the surface. So, so essentially you can clearly see phospholipid bilayer, um, bilayer range, uh, region, and, and which is even more important, uh, you can see tether region with exchangeable water. Those two blue and red lines correspond to different water contrast, water being um, supplemented with DTO. So, so DTO has, uh, and water has uh, the contrast in neutron measurements. So essentially you see exchangeable water, which comprise uh, anywhere from, from 30 to 60% uh, in this gap between uh, separating uh, the bilayer and solid support. Actually, our group, you know, together with American scientists, was the, the first who, who experimentally have uh, proven, you know, the existence and, and, and of this gap and the water fill gap and, and the existence of exchangeable water. So the same methodology can be used to, to visualize uh, protein material distribution, and of course, uh, used to, can be used to, to to some extent in elucidating the, the structure of, of reconstituted proteins. The alpha hemolysin is, is a very nice example how uh, precisely can material uh, protein material distribution can be obtained, and and you can, of course. Uh, uh, make sure that uh, most of the, the proteins uh, which uh, uh, contributes to, to the neutron reflection uh, signal uh, are in functional state. So here's uh, another way of representing neutron data, you know, the material distribution curves, you know, the blue uh, uh, curves uh, uh, correspond to proximal to the surface and, and distal uh, leaflet of the phospholipid and the, and the red, uh, red line, you know, shows the distribution of Two proteins, uh, pyolysin, which is implicated in infection diseases in cattle, and uh, uh, wild type uh, vaginolysin, which is uh, one of the major pathogenic factor in, in, in human diseases. So the most important thing is that uh, you can establish how much of the protein is protruding above the membrane and, and what's the material, protein material distribution inside the membrane. Surprisingly, two different experiments done uh, on two different types and two different systems, you know, uh, reveal very similar, uh, similar st protein structure inside the membrane, which is consistent uh, essentially with the atomic force microscopy data uh, in the part uh, which is related to the, to the um, the protrusion of the protein above the, the membrane. Approximately six, seven nanometers is typically the, the, the size of the protein, which is just uh, going out to, of the membrane, sticking out of the membrane. A more traditional way of, of uh, monitoring uh, self-assembly processes and, and uh, also reconstitution of proteins would be a surface plasma resonance spectroscopy, which we also extensively use. Uh, this methodology can, can be calibrated with monolayer of lipids and the bilayer with lipids, and we can obtain the range of uh, SPR angle shifts, you know. Anything in between the stage give us the information about the amount of, of, of phospholipid attached to the surface, you know, shown in this cartoon. So we can essentially measure how much of the lipid is coming um, to, to the surface, and uh, uh, from this you can estimate the surface here per lipid molecule. So this is a quite simple experiment. It, it lasts only, uh, let's say 20, 30 minutes, and, and, and this gives um, an information which typically being obtained with much more sophisticated techniques. <clears throat> uh, I will switch over to a little bit more to the, to the theme which we developed extensively over the last uh, couple of years. The electrochemical impedance spectroscopy is the method which uh, essentially measures the complex resistance of the system. Uh, typically, it's being done under dynamic perturbation. In, and in most cases, uh, commercial devices use uh, sinusoidal perturbation. What you're measuring is, is a complex number, which depends on, on frequency of perturbation. And that's uh, where uh, from uh, the term uh, impedance spectroscopy comes. Uh, so essentially, the EIS data can be represented in various uh, formats. Uh, one of the most popular formats are Baudet uh, plots or complex uh, plots in, in our case. And to establish the, the capacitance value, electric capacitance value of the bilayer. 
since my layer is at the electric material, it's, it's really convenient to, to see whether or not, you know, you have after all fusion and, and interaction of proteins, you know, capacitance value, which you expect. But the most important thing, you know, I will be speaking today is, is, is the, the Bode phase plot, uh, which um, essentially contains uh, in, in TBLM systems, a special characteristic point, we call this uh, phase minima point, uh, which uh, has a, a quite complex uh, trajectories uh, 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 when uh, uh, the, the, the TBLMs, the membranes are interacting with proteins, when uh, the defect density is changing, when the defect uh, distribution across the surface is, is varying. So, so this is a very important point, and I will call this phase minima point. So there are some some examples uh, which uh, shows how we can uh, monitor and follow uh, formation of tethered bilayers in, in real time. Those are static electrochemical impedance measurements. Uh, you have, you know, a thin dielectric layer of anchoring SAMs and what you expect when, when membrane is formed, the, the semicircular to shrink down to, to approximately 0.8 microfarads, which we observe routinely. And those are dynamic electrochemical impedance, which allows you to continuously follow the process and, and interrogate you know, the, all these details, you know, how for which stages you know, the spectral development occurs. And from this, you can, you can deduce about the mechanism of the uh, fusion. So the electrochemical response uh, on ideal homogeneous bilayer is straightforward. So this is the, the capacitive response. And as I mentioned, you, know, you can expect capacitance in the range of 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Um, microfarads, which we observe, but the, when it comes to, to defects and, and any protein material sitting in the membrane is a defect, strictly speaking, you know, some of them are water filled pores, some of them are just perturbing local structure and allowing increasing the electric constant and allowing some ion flux to, to go through, through those sites. So we show that, you know, due to, to the asymmetry of the system, essentially, uh, the electric field distribution is, is very, very complex. Uh, actually, this cartoon is, was just the hypothesis which allowed us to come up with an analytical solution for the response on the, for the ideal hexagonal array of defects, which was done in 2012. So later on, we switch over to, to uh, numerical techniques, uh, which allowed us to show uh, that uh, our hypothesis indeed was, was, was true, and, and those are important, you know, electric field distribution uh, um, uh, cartoons, which show first that uh, uh, the uh, electric field distribution depends on the, on the density of defects, 40, the bottom line, and 10, top line. So in other words, you know, depending on the distance between those uh, two defects, two or more defects, uh, you may expect different uh, spectral uh, features in electrochemical response. Another important thing is that you know the uh, um, the uh, those features depend the electric field distribution depend on the frequency. At low frequencies, essentially all the electric field you know is concentrating on the on the solid support. So so this gives us very important you know answer, which I, I heard the question many times. You know if we can use you know, tether by layers for static measurements with at least uh, let's say with with uh, frequency equal zero. So the answer is not because you don't you cannot you cannot sustain at low frequency electric field uh, uh, across the, the membrane. Essential all electric field is concentrated. But if you go up, you know, to to uh, uh, higher frequencies, you can definitely find regions where electric field is is, is concentrating at the entrance into the submembrane, and also when the electric field is more or less distributed on the on the on the membrane plane. So from this uh, we came to the. Um, simple solution for approximate number of defects, which you can deduce from electrochemical impedance data. This, this formula is for, for hexagonal array of, uh, of defect distribution. But uh, we also uh, went to the analysis of heterogeneous distribution. And essentially, the graph on the left-hand side shows the, the position, the trajectory in the phase versus uh, defect density uh, um, field, which is consistent with the according to the formula which I showed before, defect density and, and frequency uh, at which uh, uh, minimum in the phase of the um, diagram occurs. The trajectory which shows that uh, both uh, uh, homogeneous uh, and, and heterogeneous uh, 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 distribution of defects uh, gives uh, qualitatively similar uh, similar dependencies, similar trajectories, but what's, what's really important now, for the first time we, we discovered that the size of the defect 
the size of the defect, and, and I would like to stress that electrochemical impedance is not a structural technique per se, it's just an electrical signal. The size of the defect de de determines the trajectory. Essentially, you can, uh, without knowing, for example, protein structure, you can, uh, from simple uh, you know, uh, trajectory of the, of the phase minima, which is shown on the, on the right-hand side, uh, you can you can uh, make conclusions about the the size of the defects, you know, and and those as you see curves uh, are quite different. Those uh, fastly increasing curves uh, corresponds to twenty five nanometer radius defects, and and the, the flat curves uh, are are uh, just one nanometer. In fact. So uh, this is the example which we are going to uh, publish. Uh, uh, so um, this is the 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 tra trajectory of the phase minima, which uh, is is more or less horizontal. So uh, since we don't know uh, what is the size and what is the morphology and structure of uh, a beta small oligomers, uh, two uh, to five uh, oligomeric units, um, uh, we we uh, can uh, um, deduce from from this observation that uh, the pores uh, presumably are relatively small and and they may not necessarily be water filled pores, but some some objects you know which uh, ex exhibits uh, higher dielectric. Uh, 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 constant and, and provides uh, some uh, uh, higher concentration of, of carriers in the membrane in those sites. So uh, uh, if we go further, uh, this is the, the plot which shows that um, essentially you can build you know, a graphs which allows to, uh, from, from the data, electrochemical impedance data, the phase minimal position and, and its development uh, during the reconstitution of protein, follow both uh, defect density variation and, and, and the size variation of defects. And here, is the example of um, uh, uh, vaginalizin, uh, which is uh, uh, being uh, um, reconstituted uh, into the membrane at uh, uh, relatively large concentrations, approximately one to two uh, nanomolar concentration. And as you see, you know, uh, temporal evolution of the defect size is, is, is quite obvious. You know, it starts with um, the first point was a little bit uh, higher because of probably interference from natural occurring defects, which might be uh, a little bit larger than uh, uh, protein introduced defects. But then when, when, the, when the protein defects uh, starts uh, uh, dominating the surface uh, uh, from fourth minute, you know, you see uh, the size increasing from eight to, to 17, 18 nanometers, which is consistent with uh, uh, static observations of, uh, of uh, um, the poor uh, reconstitution into membranes uh, by FM, where you at short times, you know, you can you can uh, see, you know, uh, partly uh, assembled pores, as you saw previously in, in the video material, and uh, later on uh, within uh, some uh, time interval, you can uh, obtain more and uh, more completed pores. So, so essentially, the electrochemical impedance, while it's not a structural technique, it allows to access uh, first uh, the the density of defects, which is very important for biosensor replications, so you, you know the real number of, of membrane in, uh, integrity impairing entities in the per, per square micron or per square nanometer on the membrane, and at the same time you, you can get access to, to, the, to the size of defects, which is, which is not very precise, I would say, but it's, it's enough uh, precise to, to discriminate between uh, this type of pores and this type of pores. Uh, and also uh, one of our latest is, is, is to, to trying to, to uh, figure out if we can identify uh, the clusters, uh, cluster formation on, on, on the surfaces by using non-structural non uh, techniques like uh, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. So here you see two examples. Pneumolysin typically gives you know, more or less random distribution of, of uh, entities that impair membrane uh, integrity. And, and as you see, you know, the, the minima uh, point moves more or less horizontally along the uh, frequency scale, which is um, essentially comparable to the defect density scale. Uh, but the vaginalizing pores tend to, to form uh, some, some small or, or large uh, clusters. Sometimes they look even like uh, uh, honeycomb uh, structures. Uh, and uh, we, uh, through the modeling, through the, through the appropriate modeling, we ask the question if we can um, distinguish those two cases, uh, because uh, as you see, you know, uh, essentially, the, the, the phase uh, trajectory, upward phase trajectory, is also consistent with the growth uh, or the pore size. So, so essentially, if, uh, uh, if the, the phase increase um, is related to the pore size growth, 
uh, uh, this uh, probably puts some questions whether or not we can discriminate between, you know, let's say increasing poor case, uh, in, in, discriminate between two cases when the poor, you know, when you uh, challenge uh, uh, poor forming uh, membrane with poor forming uh, proteins can be distinguished from the case when those uh, uh, poor forming entities are just simply uh, clustering into clusters. And, and model spectra didn't give us much more information because uh, those uh, family of three curves are homogeneous, uh, random, and clustered. They look very similar. They are very similar, like small uh, in the small defect uh, uh, domain and, and large defect domain. But when we looked uh, deeper into the, the shape of the minima, so we, we, we found that you know, the uh, full, uh, uh, full width at half minima uh, uh, can be used uh, uh, in, in, in conjunction to the position of the minima on the, on the frequency scale. We, we uh, defined the parameters zeta, essentially this is just you no know, diagnostic parameter, which uh, dependence from, from frequency tells, can tell us uh, in what uh, range, in what, in what uh, um, uh, range of clustering you, you can expect your uh, system um, would be. So uh, when you have uh, the, the left-hand uh, graph uh, uh, corresponds to the situation when the, the experimenter doesn't know exactly what is the size of the protein. So this is the range of from one, anywhere from one to, to 25 nanometers. So, so you get uh, uh, quite uh, wide relevance. Uh, and and uh, in most of our cases, we, we definitely defected some clustering. Uh, those are experimental points. But if you know more precisely what is the size of your defect, for example, here we work with alpha hemolysin, which forms a relatively small pores with one nanometer uh, radius. Uh, we clearly can, can tell that uh, you know, the, the alpha hemolysin still uh, forms, exhibits some, some uh, propensity of uh, uh, small, uh, small propensity for, for uh, cluster formation. Maybe this is not alpha hemolysin. Maybe this is the, the, the feature of the surface you know, on which uh, the membrane is assembled. So this is uh, still an open question, but uh, uh, the statement is that uh, yes, the electrochemical impedance can, can, can distinguish uh, clustered uh, cases from random defect distribution cases. And finally, our latest is um, the uh, eternal question, you know, uh, whether or not we can, can deduce uh, information, uh, uh, physical information, including microscopic information from electrochemical impedance data, um, just analyzing the spectra and, 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 and just giving, you know, the, 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 the uh, just, just finding from the spectra the, the type of distribution of defects. And those are quasi-experimental quasi data sets. We, we've done this with the real experimental data sets. Now it's being in preparation. But the quasi-experimental data set uh, gives us uh, very definitive answers. So yes, we, we can uh, 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 recover uh, from electrochemical impedance spectra the distribution type. It's, it's, it's quite a, a complex distribution, one peak here and, and the shoulder here. So uh, all these details can be uh, um, recovered and at the same time, of course, numerical parameters can be obtained. Of course, as we expected, the, the radius of defects cannot be precisely determined if you are looking for a type of distribution and, and let's say simultaneously looking at the defect size. But the defect density could be, uh, could be obtained with, with good precision and other parameters also are Pretty much, uh, pretty much precise. So finally, uh, several applications by sensors, uh, the straightforward uh, way of application of, of uh, electrochemical impedance in tether by layers, both in SPR methodology and EIS methodology. EIS methodologies, in our opinion, at least in, in this system for regionalizing detection is much more uh, sensitive. Uh, by sensors for membrane associated proteins, uh, the heat shock protein is not a transmembrane protein. Um, at least to our knowledge, uh, um, HSP elevated uh, uh, levels in urine are associated with bladder cancer. So we, we show that in, in urine, in other biological systems, TBLMs can be used and, and, and quantitative information can be obtained. And finally, uh, immunoelectrochemical testing by ES uh, to, to identify the poor forming toxins also can be done. Uh, this is pretty much standard operation. You, 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 to, you do uh, two channel measurements. You, you inject sample and inject sample with uh, monoclonal antibodies for, for the toxin you're looking for. And if uh, signal is positive, then uh, the, 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 the answer is positive. And, and if it's negative, so either you don't have toxin or you have some other type of toxins.
So finally, I would like to briefly tell that uh, all these uh, methodologies I was talking about are available through our open access center at Life Sciences Center in Vilnius, you know, which you can access on the internet using this address. And then the contact person is Mrs. Aurelia Geffenine. So essentially, uh, these techniques, including both instruments and, 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 and numbering techniques, uh, are available for external users as well. So briefly about research team. Uh, the research team is, is uh, at Life Sciences, located at the Life Sciences Center at the Institute of Biochemistry. I really appreciate uh, uh, all the input uh, which I received in preparation of this talk by uh, Rima, Maria, uh, Tadas Radilauskas, Tadas Penkauskas, Filipa Sangulevichos. Uh, thank you very much. And, and there are other members of our groups. Uh, we uh, collaborate extensively with, uh, with uh, people from the Faculty of Mathematics and Informatics. We are really uh, would like to acknowledge our uh, colleagues from the Institute of Biotechnology, from Immunology, from also from uh, Lithuanian Health Sciences University, and and of course this uh, this uh, uh, these uh, development of these technologies uh, wouldn't be possible without international collaboration. Uh, mostly, we worked on this project with uh, with scientists from NIST, the National Institute of Science and Technology in Gatesburg, also from uh, from uh, fellows from uh, Carnegie Mellon University, Oakland University. Um, actually, the 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 project time Duncan was uh, associate of, of NIST. And also we collaborated with uh, uh, people from Irvine uh, University, California and, uh, and Ohio State University in Columbus. So the work was supported by a number of, of funding agencies, which are most importantly, most of the support came from, from our, our European structural funds, uh, which are being administered by uh, Central Project Management Agency in Lithuania and, and Lithuanian uh, Business uh, Support Agency. Also, Lithuanian Research Council was very um, supportive uh, funding you know, these, uh, these works. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor, for such an interesting presentation. So far, we have a question of the, the bacterial cell membrane in gram negatives is also a bilayer. Can we study the details of the bacterial cell membrane by ACE or SPR? If yes, how? Well, uh, if, uh, this is uh, essentially uh, the the part related to the formulation of, of uh, and, and assembly of uh, tetrabilayers. Uh, so there are some works with uh, um, uh, where total membrane extract, the lipid part, was transferred to to, to the surface, and uh, uh, total lipid extracts uh, perfectly form uh, TBLMs, and then they are. Um, well structured so that you know to chemical impedance which is very sensitive to defects actually uh, the electrochemical impedance senses defects at the level of 10 to the minus 7 10 to the minus 8 this is very small uh, density uh, compared to other methodologies so so in, in bacterial membranes were, were were transferred to to the surface and uh, and i can probably send you the the link uh, to the to the publication uh, which was done in, as far as i remember at least university in uk so uh, the full uh, composition, which includes uh, proteins, uh, uh, to my best knowledge, is, is not uh, been transferred, and at least it was not shown functionally that you know uh, proteins, uh, bacterial proteins in the membrane uh, can function in the in the same way as they do in, in bacteria. So this is, uh, I believe, uh, at least currently, uh, this is more like. Uh, a technique which uh, is minimal, minimalistic. So you essentially assemble the, the membrane of one or another composition, including bacterial compositions, and, and see how one or another protein, one or another uh, ion pump or, or pore formed, uh, forming uh, protein uh, behaves, uh, what is his, his structure, what are the steps of polarization, what is being affected by the composition of the membranes. Uh, one more question about Membrane pumps is the method suitable for membrane pumps examination, PMCA or MKA, and enzymatic assays? Well, uh, uh, the, the second part, enzymatic assays, uh, these membranes can be definitely used to, to explore uh, the enzymatic activity of proteins which are involved in, in lysis of lipids, for example, phospholipases, and that was demonstrated uh, quite long a long uh, time ago, including in our group. We, we show that uh, phospholipase uh, A2 can, can be 
quantitatively detected uh, and, and its activity can be assessed by using uh, uh, TB lamps. Speaking about uh, the pumps, uh, so uh, any any uh, um, uh, pumps, active pumps, uh, which uh, which uh, essentially requires some some energy source, of course, requires uh, a complex procedure for a constitution of the whole complex of of the of the of the um, of the proteins. Uh, there were attempts, numerous attempts to to. Uh, assemble uh, ATP uh, pumps, but one one detail is is very important. If if the pump uh, requires uh, uh, bias potential, essentially the constant potential difference across the the, the membrane, uh, it's really challenging working with with TBLMs, as I showed in my uh, slide, which uh, indicated the electric field distribution. Essentially, when when the zero goes to to when, when the frequency goes to zero, essentially when you have a constant uh, potential difference across the whole interface, the, the, the electric field uh, drop is concentrating on the on the solid substrate surface, what we call on the Helmholtz layer, so which is separating solid support from the submembrane layer. So no electric uh, field is uh, essentially on uh, across the membrane, which is essential uh, moment in 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 some uh, some pumps, which are dependent on the on the potential difference, electric potential difference. Thank you. One more question. Uh, uh, how much protein is needed and how long do the experiments take, uh, for instance, to look for clustering? Well, clusters uh, typically, and well, pro membrane protein interaction is, is, is definitely a concentration dependent uh, process. And uh, in some cases, uh, for example, uh, with uh, vaginalizing with some uh, cholesterol dependent uh, toxins, uh, uh, we can uh, observe the development of the signal within the uh, first uh, five to 10 minutes. So, so this was clear from, uh, from, um, from SPR, SPR temporal curves, which I probably can still have, can give. So can, you can see that, you know, essentially you can, you can see the development of the signal within first uh, two, 300 seconds, so essentially within several minutes. Uh, and uh, in electrochemical impedance, uh, definitely you can you can see uh, the development of the signal immediately after you inject the sample into into the chamber, uh, into the vial. But um, uh, speaking about the the sensitivity of of the the membrane uh, to to the to the to the entity which impairs membrane integrity, it all depends on on the on the type of of the of the defect. If if the defect is is just not perturbing the structure, local structure of the phospholipid arrangement, and and it, and, and this leads to an increase of, of the relative electric constant, uh, most likely you will you will uh, need you know uh, higher concentrations as as we experienced the working with uh, amyloid beta, um, uh, beta uh, material uh, with beta oligomers. Uh, and that's why we, we essentially failed to, to use this technique to, to working with the clinical samples, which requires at least three orders of magnitude lower uh, concentration sensitivity, uh, three orders of magnitude higher sensitivity. But uh, this technique works very well when, when, the, when the proteins assemble into pores or, or semi-pores or, or some uh, uh, other entities and, uh, and uh, uh, form water-filled channels. So in this case, our lowest, uh, um, uh, concentrations which we managed to detect uh, were in the range from uh, from 10 to uh, 20 picomolar concentration, which is comparable to, to physiological levels of, of toxins in, in liquids and, and tissues. Speaking about the the the, the clustering, the clustering uh, in in many cases uh, occurs uh, simultaneously with the, with a protein pores grow as I show you in, in the first video. So, so at the same time as, as one pore is, is just increasing, is, is growing, you know, you see another pore is, is, is actually not the pore, but the fraction of the pore is, is, is migrating in the, in the uh, laterally migrating and sticking to, to the another pore. So there's probably some, some interaction between uh, those pores in, in the case of cholesterol dependent uh, toxins, which uh, it, it triggers uh, cluster formation. Thank you so much, Professor Gintras Valencius. And now I would like to present uh, our second uh, presenter, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Virginius Shikshnis. 
and um, uh, he's a biochemist, a Kavli Prize winner, and uh, his lab independently developed the gene editing tool. So Professor Shikshnis uh, will give uh, today a speech about bacterial immunity. Please, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. It's my pleasure to be here. And I'm really happy that uh, Lysiana finally became an instruct member. So I still remember the first meeting many years ago when Dave Stewart and, and Susan Denker came to Vilnius to discuss the possibility of Lysiana to become instruct member. And, and finally, I am glad to see that this happened. And today I'm going to talk, to talk about uh, bacterial immunity that provides resistance against invading viruses in, in bacteria. And phages are major parasites of bacteria and they infect bacteria in order to replicate and often kill bacteria when replication is completing. In this respect, phages represent a lethal threat to bacteria However, despite of this deadly threat, bacteria thrive and, and multiply. And this is because that during the evolution, bacteria was able to build antiviral defense barriers that interfere uh, with viral infection. And since it's vital for the phage to get into the bacteria, phages are constantly evolving and, and trying to break the existing defense barriers and this forces bacteria to create new antiviral defense barriers. And this bacteria arms race between phages and bacteria are going on and on. In my lab, we are interested in molecular mechanisms of different antiviral defense systems in bacteria. Different antiviral systems or genes encoding different antiviral systems in bacteria are clustered in a so-called uh, defense islands. And in these defense islands, you know, genes encoding, uh, for example, restriction modification system, uh, CRISPR systems, and other antiviral defense systems are clustered together. And taken together, these genes comprise a primitive immune system of bacteria that provide resistance against invading, invading phages. And for many years in my lab, we studied uh, restriction modification uh, system as antiviral defense system in bacteria. And this is a simple system that is comprised of two enzyme restriction enzyme and DNA methyl transferase. Restriction enzymes recognize short nucleotide sequence uh, in the invading phage DNA and cut them stopping uh, phage uh, replication. The host DNA is protected uh, from restriction enzyme cleavage by DNA methyl transferase that uh, modifies the uh, target recognized by restriction enzyme and makes it resistant for restriction enzyme cleavage. So in this respect, a restriction modification system functions as an innate immune system of bacteria that is able to differentiate between self and non-self DNA using a methyl tag uh, on, on the specific sequence in the, uh, in the DNA. And restriction enzymes, or type two restriction enzymes, they recognize short nucleotide sequences like the, uh, the one shown here for ECO1 rest, ECO1 restriction enzyme at cut and cut within or close to the target site introducing a double strand break. And restrictions and restriction enzymes are very diverse. And there are thousands of different restriction enzymes that recognize uh, uh, very different nucleotide sequences. And in my lab, we aim to understand how different restriction enzymes achieve specificity for their target uh, sites using a combination of uh, uh, X-ray crystallography uh, biochemical and bi biophysical uh, experiments. So as I just uh, told you, restriction enzymes are very diverse. And for our studies, we decided to choose a family of restriction enzymes that recognize uh, target sequences that contain a concept uh, CCGG 
tetranucleotide core that is uh, flanked by different uh, nucleotides outside the uh, concept CCG, CCGG core. And we aim to solve the crystal structures of restriction enzymes belonging to, the, uh, to, to this group in order to understand how nature achieved specificity for different nucleotide uh, uh, sequences. And we also wanted to correlate the crystal structures of restriction enzymes with their uh, bi biological function and, and specificity. And uh, this project uh, took nearly 20 years, but at the end, and it started in the lab of Robert Huber, when I was a visiting scientist at Max Planck Institute of Biotechnology, and, and Solius Grajulis and Matthias Bochtler were the key uh, <coughs> persons be behind this project. So finally, we were able to solve crystal structures of all restriction enzymes belonging to, to this family. And using the structural information, we were able to identify that all these restriction enzymes, in fact, contain a conserved structural core comprised of five beta strands that are flanked by, by, by two alpha helices. And this structural core carries conserved amino acid uh, residues that are responsible for the uh, recognition of the CCGG uh, tetranucleotide. And the outer nucleotides outside the CCGG core are recognized by amino acid residues that are located on the additional structural elements that uh, decorate the concept structural core. And these additional structural elements are uh, different, uh, distinct between different uh, restriction enzymes. And we naively thought that if we would be able to understand the general mechanism, how restriction enzymes achieve uh, their specificity, we would be able to design restriction enzymes uh, that could cleave at any, any DNA sequence. However, it turned out to become uh, to, to be a really challenging uh, task because restriction enzymes recognize their target sites making hydrogen bonds between amino acid uh, residues and donor and acceptor atoms on their base edges in their DNA. And each donor and uh, each base pair in the DNA uh, uh, provides a unique combination of uh, donor and acceptor atoms in the major group of the DNA. So if one wants to re-engineer specificity of a restriction enzyme, so one needs to change amino acid residues at the protein DNA interface. And this requires a lot of, of protein in engineering and is a, a major limitation in, in the redesigning of restriction enzymes. And even if one succeeds to design new restriction enzyme variants that are able to recognize different nucleotide sequences, these variants are often prone to uh, uh, off-target activity that in the restriction enzyme uh, field we, we, we call uh, star activity. So at some point in my lab, we became a bit frustrated by, by these re-engineering efforts and started to look for, for something new. And in two, uh, 2007, a paper appeared in Science Journal that claimed that a new antiviral defense system called CRISPR has been uh, discovered in, in, in bacteria. So when phage infects bacteria, most of the bacteria uh, dies. However, a small number survives. And it turned out that in the survivors that carried CRISPR-Cas system, uh, the bacteria was able to hijack small pieces of invading viral DNA and insert them as spaces in a CRISPR array in the bacteria genome. And later use these newly inserted uh, viral DNA fragments as template to produce small RNA molecules that are called CRISPR RNA. 
And these small RNA molecules together with uh, Cas proteins encoded uh, by Cas genes in the vicinity of CRISPR array form a so-called effector complex that is able to uh, distract uh, invading viral DNA during the next round of infection. So in this respect, CRISPR-Cas system in bacteria functions as an adaptive immune system that is able to memorize the invader by inserting pieces of invaders DNA into the host, uh, host genome. And in my lab, we aim to understand how different CRISPR-Cas systems that are present in Streptococcus thermophilus bacteria provide interference against invading, uh, invading viruses. And Streptomophilus is an important industrial strain that is used for production of, of cheese and, and yogurt. And it carries four different CRISPR-Cas systems that belong to different uh, <clears throat> CRISPR-Cas types. And the question, the, the next question is which uh, CRISPR-Cas system you, you choose for your studies. And we decided to, to focus on the CRISPR-3 system of Streptomophilus. Uh, because of two reasons. First, it contains the smallest number of, of Cas genes. And uh, next, one of the uh, proteins encoded by the Cas9 gene showed uh, active site, putative active site residues that we previously seen in, in restriction enzymes. So we decided uh, because we didn't know how to work with Streptomophilus, uh, so we decided to transfer the CRISPR-3 system of Streptomophilus into E. coli, that is a workhorse in, in, in the lab. Gedrus Gasunas, who was a doctoral student uh, in, in the lab together with Rima Shopranauskas, were able to clone the CRISPR-3 system in E. coli and it turned out that the CRISPR-3 system of Streptomophilus uh, transplanted in, in, into E. coli was able to provide resistance against invading phages or plasmids if a matching uh, DNA sequence was present in the CRISPR array. So this was the first demonstration that CRISPR systems are transportable between different organisms. And then using, uh, using genetic tools that are available in E. coli, we were able to show that Cas9 is a sole gene that is required, uh, required for interference against invading phages and, and plasmids. Next, we aim to characterize the Cas9 protein that is encoded uh, by Cas9 gene. And, and Gedrus Gasunas was able to isolate Cas9 protein, and it turned out that Cas9 protein uh, purified with two small RNA molecules, 42 nucleotide CRISPR RNA and 78 uh, nucleotide tracer RNA that formed a partial uh, heteroduplex. And then using a set of biochemical experiments, we were able to show that uh, Cas9 protein guided by the CRISPR RNA molecule is able to locate the target in the uh, DNA molecule and bind to it, forming a structure that is called an ALU. And then Cas9 protein using two different active sites is able to cut DNA introducing double strand, double strand break. So in this respect, Cas9 protein functions as the RNA guided restriction uh, enzyme. And it's a bit ironic that actually we switch to CRISPR studies in order to, uh, uh, since we became a bit uh, frustrated by our restriction enzyme engineering efforts and ended up with another restriction enzyme. However, uh, there is one important difference. As I told you before, the specificity of re uh, restriction enzymes are achieved through amino acid interactions uh, with donor and acceptor atoms on the base edges. In the case of Cas9, the specificity is dictated by Watson Creek interactions between the CRISPR RNA molecule and matching, matching DNA, DNA target. 
the simple modular organization of uh, Cas9 RNP complex where specificity is dictated by CRISPR RNA molecule and cleavage is provided by Cas9 protein created a universal platform for engineering of uh, versatile RNA guided uh, DNA uh, cleaving enzymes. Indeed, by simply changing RNA sequence in the RNP complex, restriction and uh, Cas9 protein uh, could be addressed to any target in the genome where it will introduce double strand break. And uh, this double strand break will trigger mechanisms of the cell repair that could be used for the gene knockout or, or knocking. So the simple programmable programmability uh, of Cas9 uh, RNP complex by restriction uh, by RNA molecule created a versatile uh, tool for genome editing in, in different model organisms. And Cas9 uh, protein is really a great tool that is now rapidly advancing into the clinic for treatment of different diseases, including cardiovascular disease, liver disease or ocular disease that uh, cause blindness. So it's a great tool. However, there are still some challenges that limit Cas9 uh, applications. And uh, in my talk today, I will focus on the Cas9 challenges that are related to targeting space limitation or so-called PAM, PAM problem and uh, delivery size uh, limitations. Since there are challenges, uh, one could also look for solutions that could allow you to overcome these challenges. And uh, of course, one can try to engineer existing Cas9 proteins uh, to overcome the PAM limitation problem or uh, engineer some, uh, Cas9 variants of, of smaller size. Uh, and alternatively, one can look at the national diversity of, of Cas9 proteins to find uh, novel Cas9 <coughs> or orthologs. And in my lab, we have focused on this national diversity approach. So as I said, already said, the Cas9 specificity is dictated by uh, guide, uh, CRISPR RNA binding to the matching uh, DNA sequence. However, to initiate CRISPR RNA binding, uh, Cas9 protein first has to recognize so-called PAM sequence, and, and PAM stands for, for a protospace adjacent motif. And this PAM sequence is a characteristic feature of Cas9 protein, and different Cas9 proteins uh, recognize different, different PAM sequences. And this PAM sequence requirement limits target site selection. For example, uh, GG PAM sequence requirement constrains uh, S pyogenes Cas9 targeting to every eight base pairs in a human genome. And this makes uh, a large number of mutation associated with human disease non-accessible for uh, Cas9 uh, editing uh, if a precise targeting is considered. So we reason that Cas9 uh, orthologs that recognize different PAM sequences could help to overcome this PAM requirement uh, limitation and expand targeting sequence space. And Cas9 orthologs are really very abundant and there are thousands of Cas9 orthologs in databases. And to identify these Cas9 orthologs, we developed a phylogeny guided bioinformatic pipeline that allowed us to identify large number of Cas9 uh, orthologs uh, that uh, <coughs> were, and this information was used to build a uh, phylogenetic tree of Cas9, uh, Cas9 orthologs. So for each Cas9 orthologs, three independent requirements has to be established, CRISPR RNA sequence, trace RNA sequence, and, and PAM sequence. The first two requirements, CRISPR RNA and trace RNA, they can be predicted bioinformatically. However, it's really difficult to predict PAM sequence bioinformatically and, and to establish PAM sequence 
therefore experimental approaches are required. And in my lab, we developed a PAM interrogation, PAM specificity assay for Cas9 orthologs uh, based on the Cas9 cleavage of the plasmid DNA library that contains a, target, a sequence targeted by Cas9 protein. And this target sequence is flanked by randomized seven nucleotide sequence that corresponds to PAM. And this plasmid DNA library is uh, subjected by Cas9 cleavage in vitro. The cleavage products are captured by ad adaptive ligation and subjected for DNA sequence to establish PAM sequences that uh, license cleavage. And I would like to point out that uh, this assay is a positive selection assay since it allows to identify only those PAM sequences that license, uh, license cleavage. With this uh, PAM specificity assay uh, in hand, we got back to our phylogenetic tree and then selected a hundred of Cas9 orthologs that belong to the different branches of the phylogenetic tree. And the genes uh, that we selected uh, of, of Cas9 orthologs that we selected were codon optimized and uh, expressed in the in vitro uh, transcription translation uh, system to obtain the Cas9 protein. And the guide uh, RNA was predicted bioinformatically and uh, obtained either by in vitro trans, uh, transcription or in vitro, uh, during in vitro transcription and translation directly in the IVT mix. And then the Cas9 RNPs were used to cleave uh, <clears throat> plasmid DNA library to establish PAM requirements for different Cas9 orthologs. And our biochemical screen, in fact, reported uh, PAM sequences for more than 60 or, uh, Cas9 orthologs that differed both by uh, nucleotide composition and, uh, and lens. And we were able to establish uh, PAM sequences uh, that uh, were comprised of only two nucleotides and uh, also longer PAM sequences that were comprised up to five or uh, five nucleotides. And these PAM sequences differed, uh, differed also in nucleotide composition. Uh, some Cas9 orthologs showed specificity for A-rich PAM sequences. Some of them showed specificity for T-rich, C-rich, or, or, or G-rich PAM, PAM sequences. So uh, in conclusion, our biochemical screen allowed to, to produce the catalog of Cas9 uh, orthologs that show very different PAM requirements. And uh, I think that this, uh, these Cas9 Cas9 proteins could be used for uh, genome editing experiments to overcome uh, sequence, uh, sp targeting sequence uh, limitations. So to make all these Cas9 orthologs available for research community, we established a Cazyme company that will provide, uh, uh, will make all these Cas9 orthologs available for, for uh, researchers. So, in the next few minutes, I would like to talk to you about our efforts also to overcome uh, delivery problems for Cas9 orthologs. Cas9 protein is a relatively large protein and currently adeno-associated viruses are major vehicle of delivery uh, when uh, therapeutic uh, applications are considered. However, AV vectors have their own cargo packaging limit so therefore, smaller Cas9 variants are, or smaller variants of other genome editing tools are, are highly desirable. And again, I will focus on the, our efforts to identify smaller genome editing tools uh, uh, using a natural diversity approach. And recently, Schmackoff and Harrington uh, bioinformatically identified a new set of uh, uh, Cas proteins that they called Cas14 proteins that uh, 
belong to the type 5 CRISPR-Cas uh, uh, systems. And these Cas14 proteins that, according to a new nomenclature, are called now Cas12F proteins, belong to the same protein family as Cas12A or CPF protein of type 5 CRISPR-Cas system that is also widely used for genome editing experiments. However, there is one important difference. The Cas12F proteins, they are nearly half size of the uh, Cas12A uh, protein. And therefore, we call these Cas12F proteins uh, miniature nucleases. So in order to establish uh, biochemical cleavage requirements for these miniature nucleases, we used uh, the same approach that we employed for characterization of Cas9 ortologs. We selected 10 different genes from the phylogenetic tree of Cas12F proteins, and then expressed these genes in, in E. coli together with a CRISPR locus that targeted uh, the sequence that was present in our plasmid DNA, plasmid DNA library. And then we captured uh, plasmid DNA library cleavage products by uh, adaptal ligation and established uh, DNA cl uh, cleavage requirements for these miniature Cas12 F uh, nucleases. And indeed, we have found that all these miniature nucleases cleaved double-stranded DNA in a PAM-dependent manner. Most of them required TT-rich PAMs, however, one of them showed preference for CC uh, rich PAM. So next we decided to explore whether these miniature nucleases in fact could be used for uh, genome editing in the eukaryotic cells. And, and uh, for, for that purpose, we engineered a plasmid that contained uh, two, different, uh, two different plasmids that contained two different miniature nucleases uh, and uh, guide RNA that targeted three different sites in, the, in a human genome. And uh, we transformed hex cells with uh, these uh, plasmids encoding miniature nucleases, and nucleases and followed the genome editing outcome in the human cells using uh, uh, deep sequencing uh, of, of these three targets that detect uh, insertions or deletions uh, at the target sites that results from the uh, nu nuclease cleavage. And indeed, using deep sequencing, we were able to uh, detect uh, mutations in two of the three sites for the SPCAS12F uh, uh, nuclease and no mutations were detected for uh, AS-Cas12F protein. So when our paper in Nature Communication was in progress, describing the uh, uh, new miniature nucleases and their application for targeted DNA modification, three papers appeared in, in three different journals that claimed that in fact, miniature uh, Cas12F uh, nucleases could be used uh, to engineer uh, mammalian genomes and also to, uh, for regulation of, of uh, mammalian genomes. And also another paper have shown that these miniature nucleases uh, are compatible with adeno associated viruses for their, their delivery into uh, mammalian, mammalian cells. So, in the second part of my talk, I showed you that due to our efforts, we were able to expand the CRISPR toolbox. So now, instead of having a single pair of scissors, we have multiple scissors that uh, recognize different PAM sequences. And these scissors can, can allow us to overcome uh, PAM limitation for uh, genome editing applications. And then also showed you that we were able to uh, find miniature Cas12F nucleases that uh, could help us to overcome the <clears throat> delivery problem. And due to the lack of time, I was unable to 
tell you the story uh, about uh, TNPB nuclease uh, that is in fact um, the smallest genome editing tools that we identified recently and this TNPB nuclease could uh, also could be used for the genome editing uh, applications. So I think that all these genome editing tools could be used for uh, different uh, uh, genome uh, modifications. And of course, such a variety of different uh, genome editing tools cries for structural studies. And recently at the Life Science Center of Vilnius University, uh, Glacios Cryo EM electron microscope has been installed. And I hope that during the next instruct uh, uh, meeting, we'll be able to uh, uh, show you structural data that were obtained at the Vilnius uh, University Life Science Center. So finally, I would like to acknowledge people who contributed to, uh, to this work, my team at, at, at Vilnius University, my collaborators at, at Kazime Company, and also uh, Cortiva AgriScience, New England Biolabs, and, and Cardia. And, uh, I would like to thank Lithuania Research Foundation and, and Mita for funding. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor, for such an interesting presentation and in inspiring and inviting. Uh, any questions? Uh -huh. So what type of structural experiments you foresee or would like uh, happening first? Yeah, so actually, we would like very much to look at the structures of these miniature nucleases and especially into the structure of the TNPB nuclease that we uh, <clears throat> characterized very, very recently in order to understand how actually these miniature nucleases are organized. And I hope that this understanding could help us to redesign uh, the structures of these miniature nucleases, for example, to, to interact or, or to, to be more specific for different PAM sequences or improve the, the specificity of these enzymes. Thank you. And one more question. How does the miniature uh, nuclease improve delivery? So as, as I said, uh, the AVV vector, adeno associated viruses are the major vehicles of delivery in the human therapeutic applications, and they have their own packaging limit. So therefore, miniature nucleases could overcome. And, and now, actually, what people are doing, they often are using two AVV vectors or split AVV uh, uh, approach that means that uh, they are using one vector to deliver Cas9, another vector to deliver guide RNA. Using miniature nucleases, actually, both guide RNA and, and genome editing tools could be packaged into a single vector, and, and this could be a, a real advantage. Thank you so much for for today's uh, two noble uh, presenters, uh, Professor Gintres Valinchus and Professor Virginia Shikshinis. And uh, yes, and we are very thankful for your attention to the Zainia Instructors webinar. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, the recording of the webinar will soon be av available on the Instruct website. So everyone can uh, rewind and, and, and see it again. And so far, I would like to uh, invite you to thank, of course, uh, both of the presenters once more and uh, to invite you to Instruct Eric webinar that will take part in uh, 14th of December. The whole attention would be to Instruct Center Portugal uh, with three uh, presenters. So you can start register now. You can see in chat box the link to Portugal webinar. And uh, thank you so much.